A dangerous game of tit for tat has consumed the war in Ukraine. Drone warfare, once a secondary tool, has now become the focus of the conflict. Every time Ukraine develops a new drone tactic, Russia quickly responds with one of its own. Then Ukraine counters again, creating a relentless cycle where each side races to outsmart the other. But this time Ukraine seems to have broken that pattern. It has unveiled a new weapon, a drone that can strike not just equipment or vehicles, but the very operators who control Russia's own unmanned aerial forces. That drone has already hit one of Russia's most important military units, and the results were devastating. The story begins with one of Russia's most feared formations, Rubicon. Officially called the Center for Advanced Unmanned Technologies, this elite drone warfare unit was formed in August 2024. It was created in direct response to Ukraine's growing mastery of drone combat. Rubicon's mission was simple, but ambitious to beat Ukraine at its own game. The unit specialized in using drones to locate, track, and destroy Ukrainian forces and supplies with precision and speed. Within months, Rubicon became a nightmare for Ukraine's defenders. It was Russia's most technologically advanced drone command, and it changed how the Kremlin fought the war. Multiple outlets, including Forbes, David Kirichenko, and RFERL, describe Rubicon as highly effective. The unit used a combination of reconnaissance drones and deadly first-person view FPV strike drones to expand what soldiers called the kill zone. These kill zones made it dangerous for Ukrainian troops to move along supply routes, deliver ammunition, or rotate forces near the front. Rubicon's drones hit everything from trucks to armored vehicles. In many regions, it became nearly impossible for Ukraine to transport supplies safely. The more Rubicon operated, the more Ukraine struggled to keep its front lines supplied and its troops alive. But what made Rubicon truly dangerous wasn't just its weapons, it was its organization. Its operators didn't sit on the battlefield. They worked from secure bases far behind Russian lines, often deep inside occupied Ukrainian territory. These skilled pilots controlled drones remotely from command centers that were nearly impossible to reach. Ukraine's typical FPV drones, small machines with limited range, couldn't fly far enough to hit them. Long-range drones, which could travel hundreds of kilometers, were too valuable to use for tactical targets like a drone command post. Rubicon had found a sweet spot, a place where it could operate safely, shielded from retaliation. Maria Berlinska stated the unit was expanding, projecting 5,000, 6,000 personnel by autumn spread across multiple command centers along the front. For Ukraine, Rubicon became one of the most pressing threats in the war. It wasn't just another drone team, it was an entire system, one that multiplied Russia's reach and efficiency. If Ukraine couldn't find a way to strike Rubicon's operators, it risked losing even more ground in the months to come. Then, on November 4th, Hayar announced a strike in Avdivka. That day, Ukraine's main intelligence directorate, known as AHUR, announced that it had carried out a precision strike on a Rubicon headquarters located in the city of Avdivka in the occupied Donetsk region. The news appeared on Hor's official telegram channel. The post explained that Ukrainian operatives had located the Russian Rubicon Center, operating inside a partially destroyed building. The message was blunt. This was one of Russia's most advanced and heavily funded units, and it had just been hit. The statement described Rubicon as one of the most combat-ready structures of the Russian occupation army, noting that Moscow poured enormous resources into keeping it operational. The moment the target was confirmed, HUR acted. Ukrainian forces launched a new wave of drones against the site, and what followed was both precise and brutal. The Rubicon command post was struck repeatedly, and the explosions partially collapsed the building. Inside were officers, technicians, and drone operators, the people who had been orchestrating attacks on Ukraine's troops for months. Ukraine reported multiple Russian personnel killed. Independent confirmation and ranks were not specified. While Ukraine did not release exact casualty figures, intelligence sources confirmed the casualties were significant. But what made this strike so extraordinary wasn't just the target. It was the weapon. QR revealed it had used a new kind of drone, something Russia had not yet seen in action, the FP-2. Built by the Ukrainian company Firepoint, the FP-2 is not a small kamikaze drone like the FPVs that Ukraine often uses, nor is it a large, expensive strategic drone designed for long-range missions inside Russia. 
Instead, it sits in between a medium-range, high-payload strike drone capable of flying deep into occupied territories to hit fortified positions and command centers. This new machine bridges the gap between affordability and range, giving Ukraine a weapon that is both powerful and practical. The FP-2 can carry a warhead weighing up to 105 kilograms, about 230 pounds, enough to destroy a two-story building or annihilate an entire platoon. Its range is around 200 kilometers, or about 124 miles, meaning it can be launched from far behind Ukrainian lines and still reach deep inside enemy territory. Despite its size and power, it is surprisingly cheap. The estimated unit cost is roughly $55,000. That's less than one-tenth the cost of a traditional cruise missile, yet its destructive potential in urban combat is enormous. This wasn't the first time Ukraine had used the FP-2 in battle. Earlier in 2025, Ukraine had reportedly struck another Rubicon facility about 20 kilometers behind the front lines. Video footage of that attack spread online, showing the FP-2 taking off into the night. Its body looked more like a small airplane than a drone. As it disappeared into the dark, the video switched to its onboard camera feed, grainy black and white footage showing a building surrounded by trees. The drone sped toward its target, the camera flickered, and then the feed went dead. A few seconds later, another camera, mounted on a separate reconnaissance drone, captured a massive explosion lighting up the night sky. Open source video, widely shared by OSINT accounts, suggested multiple FP-2 impacts, approximately 20 km behind the line. Ukraine then launched more FP-2Es, delivering follow-up strikes that finished the job. That earlier success proved what the FP-2 could do, but the November strike in Avdivka took things even further. It showed that Ukraine could now target Russia's most advanced drone unit, even in areas long thought untouchable. Rubicon's operators, who once worked with confidence from behind the front, now realized that nowhere was safe. The psychological effect of this operation was as important as its physical impact. Rubicon had symbolized Russia's growing technological edge. Its operators were the invisible hand behind many of the attacks that crippled Ukraine's logistics. But after the Avdivka strike, UA officials framed the action as deterrence and retribution. Ukrainian officials framed the operation not only as a military success, but as an act of justice. In its announcement, Hur declared that every war crime committed by Russia would face just retribution. For Ukraine, there was another layer to this story. Revenge. The attack happened in Avdivka, a city that carried deep emotional weight. The Battle of Avdivka, fought between October 2023 and February 2024, had been one of the most brutal and costly engagements of the entire war. Both sides suffered enormous losses. For Ukraine, the fall of Avdivka was a painful defeat. Once one of its strongest fortresses in Donetsk, the city became a symbol of the heavy price Ukraine paid to defend its land. Reports at the time, like Newsweek, cited UA estimates of approximately 17,000 RUKIA during the five-month battle, and roughly 30,000 more were wounded. The total casualty count approached 47,000. Ukrainian losses were also severe, though never fully disclosed. Thousands of Ukrainian troops likely perished during the chaotic withdrawal from the city. Civilians suffered terribly. Most of the city's pre-war population of over 30,000 fled or were killed. When the fighting ended, Avdivka was little more than rubble. The destruction of Rubicon's base in that same city a year later was therefore deeply symbolic. Ukraine wasn't just striking a drone unit, it was reclaiming its pride. It was delivering payback for one of its darkest moments. The ruins of Avdivka, once a sign of Ukrainian loss, had now become the setting for Russian defeat. The introduction of the FP-2 drone marks a turning point in Ukraine's drone strategy. For the first time, Ukraine has a mid-range system that can hit deep targets without spending millions of dollars per strike. The FP-2 bridges the gap between short-range FPV drones and long-range strategic UAVs. It's affordable enough to be produced in large numbers, powerful enough to destroy hardened positions, and precise enough to avoid unnecessary collateral damage. It gives Ukraine a new weapon to target command posts, ammunition depots, communication hubs, and specialized units like Rubicon that were once thought untouchable. 
The Ukraine war has always been a test of adaptation. Each side learns, adjusts, and evolves. When Russia developed Rubicon to counter Ukraine's drones, it seemed to gain the upper hand. But Ukraine's creation of the FP-2 shows that innovation still favors advocates. It demonstrates that even under constant attack, Ukrainian engineers and soldiers continue to find new ways to fight back. The November strike in Avdivka was more than a tactical win. It was a message. It told Russia there were no safe zones in occupied Ukraine. It reminded the world that Ukraine, though battered, remains resourceful, creative, and relentless. Rubicon, once the hunter, had become the prey. And as Ukraine prepares to produce more FP-2 drones, the skies over occupied territory are about to become far more dangerous for Russian forces. Command centers that once operated in the shadows will have to move constantly. Drone pilots who once watched the battlefield from afar will now fear becoming targets themselves. The FP-2 may not decide the outcome of the war, but it changes the rules of engagement. With every new strike, Ukraine proves that intelligence, technology, and determination can still overcome overwhelming odds. In this brutal war of machines, it's not always the biggest army that wins, it's the side that learns faster, 